There's going to be quite a few verses we're going to be going through this morning, uh, so keep your Bibles handy there. I know that when I was a boy, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and some of you may be old enough to remember this, but we used to have what were called Bible drills. Does anyone remember that? Anyone did that? And that's where you basically get your Bible, and they say, you know, present arms, and then you get it out there, and then you find, they give you a verse, and the first person to find it, of course, got a point and a prize of some kind or whatever, probably a piece of candy or whatever. A 10-year-old, 11-year-old would uh, think that's just fantastic, you know? I know I did. So anyway, this morning I want to talk to you about keeping your relationship, actually intimate relationship with God. As a Christian, you know, you're already saved, but now how do you keep your relationship fresh and vibrant? So I want to start out by reading a story to you. It's a very interesting story. In 1830, a man named George Wilson killed a government employee who caught him in the act of robbing the mails. Wilson was tried and sentenced to be hung. hung. The President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, sent Wilson a pardon. But Wilson did a strange thing. Because of his hatred for the President, he refused to accept the pardon. No one seemed to know what to do because of this, so Wilson's case was sent to the U.S. Supreme Court. Chief Justice Marshall wrote the opinion, and here it is. Quote, a pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. And he was. Strange story, huh? And as, as most of you already know, because I know most of you are Christians, that before coming to Christ, we were, like George Wilson, condemned and under the sentence of death because of our crimes, our sins against God. When, however, we believed in Jesus, for me, I was a young man, 17, and accepted his freely offered sacrifice on our behalf. We were pardoned from the death sentence and declared to be righteous in Christ and given the hope of a glorious future of living and fellowshipping with him for all eternity. But if there's anyone here in this room or that's listening on the video or audio later, if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, I strongly implore you to do, do so. Do not make the same mistake as George Wilson. Jesus offers you a pardon. He offers to take your place, but you have to accept it. It's a freely offered gift, but if you say no, then you really have no one to blame but yourself. So... Why not accept his freely given pardon today? Jesus put it this way in John chapter 5, verse 24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. Amen? And the Apostle Paul put it this way in Colossians 1, verse 13. He that is God, has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus. And for those of you that have not accepted Christ as your Savior, I strongly implore you to do so, so that you can know that you will be with Christ in heaven and you have a glorious future. And I'll say this, if that's your desire, uh, why don't you come see myself or one of the other elders or deacons and just come up by the cross after, after we dismiss today and uh, we can help you with that, okay? As Christians, we know, however, don't we, that even after coming to Christ, that doesn't mean we no longer sin, amen? We do sin, don't we? We still have... As it said, a little poem, two natures beat within my breast, 
One is foul and one is blessed. One I love and one I hate. The one I feed will dominate. You need to remember that, yeah? It's, uh, we have these, uh, we have, even though we have the Spirit of God in us, and we're in our inner man we want to do good, we still have this pull of the flesh. And we sin. This morning I want to ask and hopefully answer the question that as Christians, if we have been forgiven of all of our sins, and we have, all of our sins, past, present, and future, why are we then still instructed uh, in the Bible to keep confessing them to God and asking for forgiveness? A lot of you already know the answer to that, but it's good for us to be reminded of it, isn't it? I know that, uh, I will tell you this, that when I uh, was a young Christian, I was in the military when I accepted Christ. And I thought when I accepted Christ, I would not sin anymore. And I went home and I was so happy. And then a couple, it wasn't too long. And I found that pull of the sin. And I, I was a little bit angry about it, to be honest. I thought, I'd met, what's, what's this all about? I thought maybe I'd been conned, you know? Or maybe I really wasn't saved. But that's not the case. And I, and I went to my pastor and talked to him about it, and he explained it to me, that we still have these, this pull in our flesh and that God's provided a way for us to confess our sins when we do sin. So sadly, we all know far too well that it's still possible for us to sin and when we do sin, it grieves the heart of God. You know, we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit. God is grieved when we sin because he knows that it causes us harm. He knows it's going to hurt us. And that if we leave it unconfessed, it will short-circuit our relationship with him, our daily walk with him. And in addition to that, although God is faithful to forgive us of our sins when we confess them, we must still suffer the consequences of our sin in our lives. In other words, we can choose the sin, can't we? But we cannot choose the consequences. I don't like that. <laughs> I would like, if I'm going to choose the sin, I would like to soon not have the consequences. But we know that's not how it works. The wages of sin is what? Yeah. yeah. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Speaking to the first century Christians in Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul warned them, do not be deceived. Now keep in mind, who is he talking to? Christians or unbelievers? Christians. He's writing his letter to the Christian church in Galatia. So he's telling these Christians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man sows that shall he also reap. For he, he that sows to his flesh, so we can sow to our flesh as a believer, can't we? We can continue sinning. So he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. As his, voice, as his verse points out, it's certainly possible for a Christian to continue sinning in the flesh. That is, it's still possible for all of us to sin. And this is where the believer's confession of sin and God's forgiveness comes in. Before uh, going further, let me uh, clarify one thing. As long as we remain in these bodies, we will, be complete, we will not, never be completely sinless. But as we grow and mature in Christ, we should certainly find ourselves sinning less. Okay? And I think you do. I know that if I look back over my life, and uh, I would say that uh, probably when I first came to Christ, it was 90% Bob and maybe 10% God, <laughs> because I was trying to do a lot of it in my own flesh. But as I've grown and grown and grown, hopefully now it's more 90% God and 10% Bob, because Jesus told us that apart from him, we can't do anything. So the thing is, is that we have been completely 
forgiven of our sins. And while we will never be totally sinless while we're in this body, as we grow in Christ, we should find ourselves sinning less and less and becoming more and more like Jesus. Speaking to Christians in the first century, the Apostle John writes in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Now, you know, I want to explain this word confess because if any of you came from a Roman background, Roman Catholic Church or whatever, maybe a legalistic church of some kind, confession might mean, a to- might mean a totally different thing to you. It might mean going to see a priest and getting a little booth and confessing your sins to a man. Well, what does the word confess mean in this, in this verse where John is saying that if we confess our sins? The Greek word for it is homo legato. So it's a hybrid word made up of two different words. Homo means the same. Okay? means the same. Legato is a root word of the word that we read in 1 John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word logos, logos, is used there. Legato is a root word of logos, and it means to say the same thing. That's literally what it means, to agree. Okay? So when we confess our sins, we are saying we agree with God that what we have done is wrong, and we ask him for forgiveness. That's pretty simple, isn't it? We're not making any excuses about it. We say, God, I did it. I did do it. It was all me. I did it. And I'm sorry I did it. And I know it grieved your heart. And quite frankly, it grieves my heart too. And we ask him to forgive us. And when he does, when we do that, he says he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How God forgives us for our sins and that forgiveness entail, and, and what that forgiveness entails has sometimes been misunderstood by Christians. It's important to, uh, for a Christian to know and understand that once they brought their life to Jesus and received his salvation, all their sins are forgiven. If you remember in Isaiah, Jesus, uh, God said he puts it as far as the east is from the west. So that's infinity. I mean, how, what does that mean? It means, obviously, he, he puts them away. They're gone. And he says, you know, he, he uh, puts them in the sea. And then as Cory Timboom used to like to say, and he puts up a no fishing allowed sign. So all of our sins are forgiving. All, as Pastor Jay likes to say, all is all. All, as in past, present, and future, right? And this is difficult for us to grasp. And legalistic teaching has sometimes said otherwise. Doesn't that mean then that a Christian doesn't need to keep asking God for forgiveness of their sins? Does that mean that? No. And as we shall see, we are all to keep asking, but the asking is for a completely different reason. You see, when you came to Christ and you came in faith, and you can you know, you came and you said, I'm a sinner, I need a savior, and I want to accept Christ as my savior. And when we did that, as Jesus said, we passed from death to life, okay? So we were saved. That's called justification. As I used to say in the Baptist, it's just as if I didn't do it. Well, I'm not quite sure that's (laughs) totally sure, right? But we are justified. Justified really means we are declared legally. It's a legal term. And it means we are legally declared to be righteous, okay? Uh, Another way of putting it is you are freed at that moment from the penalty of sin. In other words, you don't have to die for your sins because Christ died for your sins. Isn't that great? All righty. So that's called justification. At the end of our life, either through the rapture or through our death, we will enter into glory, what's called glorification. And then in glorification, in eternity, we can't sin. We, in fact, are freed from the presence of sin. There will no longer be any sin there. No sin allowed. But in the meantime, between our justification 
in our sanctification, I'm sorry, our, our glorification, we have a term the Bible calls sanctification. And sanctification is where God is freeing you from the power of sin. In other words, and that takes a lifetime, you know, um, because we do sin. And when we sin, we confess it. And we get up, brush our knees off, and get, keep going, right? And when we sin, we confess it again to the Lord. And hopefully we learn through our mistakes, as I used to tell my children when they were growing up, Dad doesn't care if you fail. Sometimes you are going to fail as long as you fail forward. In other words, learn from your mistakes. And that's really what God is wanting us to do as well. So we are to keep asking and we're to continue to confess our sins and, uh, and remembering that God is faithful when we do, that he will forgive us. The legalistic teaching that keeps many Christians in unnecessary bondage and fear says that every sin must be confessed for them to go to heaven. Well, what about, uh, let's say as an example that I, I sinned and then the next moment I died and I didn't get a chance to confess that sin. Oops, right? Well, that's not true. If anybody knows their, knows their Bible, knows that God forgave us of all of our sins. So every, there's, they teach that every sin must be confessed for them to go to heaven. This is not true, and it flies in the face of the great work accomplished on, our, on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. As the following verses make adequate and adequately clear, I believe, Jesus justified us once and for all time, not based on, all, on our works, but on his. You might want to look at these. Turn to Hebrews 10.10. 10. I'll give you a minute to turn to these. Okay, in Hebrews 10.10, 10, the writer, we don't really know who the writer was. Well, obviously it was the Holy Spirit, wasn't it? Uh, but we don't know who the physical agent was on earth that God used. But it says, for God's will was for us. So God's will was for us. Okay, us. That's all of us. To be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. What is those last four words? Once for all time. Once for all time. That's pretty clear, isn't it? In Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. Titus 4, I'm trying, sorry, Titus 3, verses 4 to 7. It says, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, born again, and renewal by the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, there's that word, we were declared righteous. Okay? We might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. It's pretty glorious, isn't it? Hallelujah for that. And I tell you, in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul said this. He says, therefore, since we have been justified, and by the word, uh, that uh, word having been, have been justified is in what the Greek calls an imperative mood. In other words, in English, we say the past is, you know, the past, so something happened in the past. Uh, last week I ate at a certain restaurant that was in the past, right? Well, the Greeks had different words for the past. You know, they had words like we do in the past, but they also had something called this imperative, uh, imperative mood. And what it meant was that it's something that happened in the past that still has effect today and will never stop having an effect. It continually goes forward all the time. Okay. The, um, so since we've been justified, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
whom we have gained access by faith. For by grace we're saved through faith, right? And that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. So we've gained access into Christ by faith, into his grace, which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of God. To justify means to show a satisfactory reason or excuse for something done, to qualify as bail. You ever thought about that? Jesus bailed you out. Uh, surety, the law, to declare innocent or guiltless, to absolve, to acquit. Pretty cool, huh? This kind of forgiveness is called judicial, and that's what happened to us when we accepted Christ. We were legally declared to be righteous. Now, were we really righteous? I mean, really, we were declared righteous. We're positionally righteous. But we all know that we still sin, right? <laughs> and aren't you glad that God made a way for us to confess those and ask for forgiveness and keep our relationship with him? So what do we then need to do? If we've been saved and completely forgiven once for all time, is there anything that we need to do regarding the sins we commit after coming to Christ? Yes, and as we shall see, it's all about relationship. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Okay, so in other words, if you sin, let's say you sinned this morning and you, and you haven't confessed it to the Lord, and something happened, the rapture happened right now, and you went to be with the Lord, you would still be with the Lord. That one sin is not going to keep you out of his presence. But what it's going to do, if time goes on and it's not confessed, it will affect your relationship with, with God. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's what we're going to be discussing about this morning. So it's not about salvation at all. It's about our relationship with Christ. We receive eternal salvation once for all. You see, you're born again. So let me ask you, when you're born again, can you become unborn? When a baby's born, I mean, I, I've got a two-year-old granddaughter. She's born. She's here. She can't be unborn. The same thing in the Christian walk. So that should give you some assurity of your salvation. You've been born again once for all. Okay? Um, and uh, just like a baby is born just one time, we're born once by the Spirit of God. And we've become alive in God's family. Just like a baby matures and grows, so we as Christians are to grow in our, in our lives. And by the way, sometimes you might say, gee, I don't seem like I've grown very much. You know, uh, I've had those feelings before. It seemed like the same, the same stuff that was dogging me five years ago is still bothering me today. Well, I'm not the person to ask. The person to ask is someone who knows me, someone, one of my friends, my wife, someone who loves me. And they will tell you, yes, you have grown. You have changed. They can see it. A lot of times we can't see it in ourselves, but others can see it in us. And that's important to remember that. Because Satan wants to come and tell you otherwise. Just like that baby grows and matures, so too we are to grow in our Christian lives. And although we've been made clean and righteous through Jesus, our habits, our thoughts, and behaviors need to be transformed by him and that transformation can take a lifetime, okay? And that's what we mean by sanctification. It can take a lifetime. And the purpose for it is to teach us to rely on God. Jesus said this, if you abide in me and I abide in you, then your joy will be full. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, what do you think he meant by that? You think he meant that you can't do anything of eternal value by yourself without his help, without him doing it? That's exactly what he meant. That is exactly what he meant. In our journey to become more like our Redeemer, we make plenty of mistakes along the way, don't we? And while some sins are quickly left behind, others are more deeply rooted. Every time we sin, it grieves God because he knows that it hurts us. And it puts 
stress on our relationship with him. This is where asking for forgiveness comes in. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Relationships restored. He's faithful to forgive us and is just in applying the payment made by Jesus through his blood to restore our relationship with him. To help you understand this, think of a relationship that you may, may have, that you may be in right now, or a relationship you've had in the past, where a wrong has been done. Someone in that relationship has been wronged. Perhaps something you did, or something someone did to you. Now, how did that make you feel? What did it do to the relationship? Do you think it might have put a strain on it? Sure it did. For a while, until the, until the wrong is confessed and try to make it right if you can. Fellowship is weakened or broken, or conversation is difficult or stopped, trust is affected. But when forgiveness is sought and given, the relationship can be restored, and that's what we call relational forgiveness. While God has already forgiven us of all of our sins, as we've mentioned several times this morning, it is our desire to have a close fellowship with him, a day-to-day -day walk with him, and God wants that as well. He wants a close, intimate relationship with you. He does. He wants you, of your own free desire, to follow him and to love him. You know, my wife has said thank you to me several times over the last 10 days for taking care of her and preparing the meals and doing the things. And I told her, I've told her this almost every time. I said, it's easy to take care of you, sweetheart. I love you. You know, when you love someone, it's not a, it's not a burden to take care of them. And you know, God wants us to love him because of what he did for us on the cross. And when we realize what he has done for us, we're, we'll love him. It's not because we're, we're told to do it. We're not commanded to do it. And that's what he's looking for, is for us to freely come to him and say, Abba or Daddy, I love you. To climb up in his lap and confess our sins and have a loving, close relationship with him. When we confess our sins and ask for God's forgiveness, we do two things. We agree with God that we have messed up, homo legato, and we need the righteousness he alone can provide. And we remind ourselves of God's amazing love and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, in light of everything I've said up to this point, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> What might keep us from asking for forgiveness? Because we don't always do it, do we? Right away. We think maybe if enough time goes by, God will just forget about it, and, or we'll forget about it. <laughs> you know, that would be great, you know? But that's not the way it works, is it? So in light of everything we've said, what might keep us from asking for forgiveness? Usually it's pride. Pride can be a big part of it. Fear or shame. You know, I could always tell when one of my little, little ones, when they were growing up, or even my grandchildren now, when they've done something wrong, because it's all over the, written all over their faces, and they're kind of hanging back, and they're not, uh, just not acting normal, you know? <laughs> they're not being their natural selves because they know they've done something wrong as a result that fear in or that guilt comes in and they feel, in the, and so it damages the relationship in a small way. All of these issues, however, if you stop and think about it, were dealt with at the cross, weren't they? And as Christians, we are now encouraged to remember that we're no longer to consider ourselves as slaves to sin. Now, before coming to Christ, we were slaves to sin. We were. You know, we were, you know, the word there is doulos. It literally means slave. Like a, like a, you ever, how many of you saw the movie Ben-Hur? You know, they were down rowing those, rowing those Roman ships, right? That's doulos, slave. That's what we were to sin. We sinned because that's who we were. 
we couldn't stop sinning. We couldn't help ourselves. But now that we've come to Christ, we've been set free from that. We're no longer a slave to sin. Paul says we're a slave to righteousness. And we're free to pursue our new life in Christ. Satan, the devil, however, has some uh, additional other plans for you. That's true. We have an enemy, and he's an accuser. He accuses us before God day and night, the Bible tells us. Jesus said that Satan is a liar, he's a murderer, and he's a thief. You don't ever forget that. And he's extremely wise, and he's extremely powerful. But Satan accomplishes his work almost all the time through deceit. He wants to deceive you. Look how he gained his mastery over Adam and Eve. He deceived Eve, didn't he? Had, did God really say? So that's his modus operandi, if you would. If he can't destroy you physically, and I'll tell you this, he'd like to. He would like to kill all of us if he had the opportunity. And it's only because God doesn't allow him to do it. Go back to the first book of Job to learn that. So if he can't destroy you physically, then he will try to destroy you spiritually. And you really need to remember this. This is God's word so that we can know what life is really, really like as a Christian. He will try to destroy you spiritually, and the reason he's going to do that is so that your witness for Christ will be ineffective. And I can tell you this, is that I've known Christians that were some of the most miserable human beings I've ever met because they were walking out of fellowship with God, and they weren't confessing that sin. And Satan loves that when Christians are like that. He loves to see us have a joyless life, no joy of being a Christian. He loves to see our witness be ineffective. You see, when you're living in sin and not confessing that sin to, to God, then you really aren't going to feel like going out and sharing the gospel with someone, are you? Because you, you, you just not. You know, you feel like it'd be hypocritical for you to do that. One of my uh, friends years ago told me, that the church is just full of hypocrites. You ever heard that before? I told him, well, come on down, join us, because there's always room for another one. <laughs> and that's true, isn't it? We're not perfect, and that's the reason we continually confess our sins. Satan loves it when we delay going to God to confess our sin. Matter of fact, I think I need to go back here a second here. We need to remember Peter's warning over in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Okay, there's that liar, that murderer, that thief. He's like a lion going around roaring and looking for someone to devour. And guess who he's looking to devour? Christians, Christians, he's after, he's after us because he knows that if we are living the Christ life and we're strong in the Lord and keeping our relationship close with God, then we're going to go out and share the gospel. And guess what? Other people are going to come to come, come to Christ. And he hates that. You know, as much as the angels rejoice in heaven, I think that they are just, just angry in hell every time someone accepts Christ as their Savior. I believe also that uh, he, uh, he fans, Satan fans the flames of our wrong thinking. For instance, you might say to yourself, I'm not worthy to go to God. Why would he want to hear from me? I feel so dirty. Of course, the truth is what? We were never worthy to go to God. Do you know that? That's true. Even prior to that particular sin, and God tells us to come boldly based on the only reason 
we ever came to him in the first place, the blood of Jesus Christ, which covers us and gains us perfect entrance into the heavenly throne room. Isn't it cunning then of Satan to try to keep us from doing the very thing that we need to do? Yeah, it's cunning. While Satan is a liar, it, it, it's God, God always tells us the truth. So let's look at a few verses to see how God views you as a Christian. Now this is how God looks at you, okay? And wouldn't you like to know how God looks at you this morning? Romans 8, 1 and 2. How many of you know that by memory? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, when Paul wrote down those words and he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, what does no mean? No. No. You know. Nada. Zero. <laughs> in other words, when you come before God, God is not there to condemn you. Jesus told, us, told Nicodemus, the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So God's not looking out to condemn you. And you are no longer under condemnation. You've been passed from death to life. How about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, where the writer encourages us, let us therefore come boldly, boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So there again, we're encouraged. They were to come boldly before the throne of grace. It's almost as if the Lord is sitting up there in a nice lazy boy rocker like I have at home. And he's just got his arms out waiting for you to come running and jump into his arms and say, Daddy. And that's what he says. He's our, spirit. he's our heavenly daddy. That's what Abba means. Jesus said Abba Father literally means Daddy. And the thing is, is that we're encouraged to run to God. And when we do, we'll obtain mercy and we'll find grace in that time of need. Those times when we sin, when we confess the sin to God. 1 Corinthians 5.21, this is one of my favorite verses. In fact, I, on our Wednesday night Bible study last year, we had a potluck and we asked everybody to share one or two of their favorite verses Verses that if they were on a desert island and they could only have two verses of the Bible, <laughs> what two would they want, okay? Now, some said, well, they wanted more than two. I said, well, for this exercise, you can only have two. But one of mine was this one, 1 uh, Corinthians 5.21. For he made him, let's see, God the Father made Jesus, okay? That's, Jesus is the him. For he made him who knew no sin... To be sin for us. Okay? That we, that's us, might become the righteousness of God in him. And that's what happened. God made Jesus sin. He who knew no sin to become sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. So Christ took our sins upon himself and then he imparted or declared us to be righteous through his righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? And when that happened, the whole... Second Corinthians? Okay, thank you. I got Second Corinthians written down. I just said First Corinthians. <laughs> oh, well, it's a senior moment. <laughs> it happens more and more often. All right, Second Corinthians 5.21. And um, also over Philippians 1.6... The Apostle Paul wrote this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, that's Jesus, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. 
So you don't even have to worry about messing up because Jesus said that he, that he began the good work in you and that he will finish it and carry it through until the day of, uh, a day of Christ Jesus. John MacArthur once said, if we could lose our salvation, we would. That's true. If we could lose it, if it depended on us, we'd lose it. It doesn't depend on us. Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he said that he began the work. He's going to carry it on till the day of Christ Jesus. So in conclusion, this, here are three things that I think we've learned this morning. One, when we come to Christ, or when we came to Christ, we were forgiven of all of our sins and declared to be righteous in Christ. And that's called what? Justification. Legally declared to be right. After coming to Christ, this is point two, it is still possible for us to commit sin. And when we do, we should be quick to confess the sin and agree with God, say the same thing, homo legato, to say the same thing. Yes, God, I did it. Yeah, I did it. It was me, all me. And I agree with you, God, that it was bad and it was wrong. And I know it grieves your heart, Father. And you know what? It grieves my heart, too. And I'm sorry for it. And I ask for forgiveness. And when we do that, the relationship's restored. Okay? So we can still sin, but when we do, we should be quick to confess it and agree with God that what we've done is wrong and to ask for forgiveness. And the third point is when we do, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to restore that relationship with him. Now, isn't that great news? I think it's great news. That's the gospel, by the way. And I think if we believe this, and there's no reason not to because God said it, right? God doesn't lie. It's in God's word. So it's a matter of you believe his word or you don't. Then I think we should all be leaving this building with a great big smile on our face and a bounce in our step. Shouldn't we? Sure we should. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be here this morning with precious uh, believers in Christ. We're so thankful, Lord, that when you saved us, you saved us from all of our sins, past, present, and future. But, Lord, we also want to keep that close relationship with you. We do not want to presume upon your grace, Lord. We want to uh, acknowledge our sins and confess them to you and ask for your forgiveness when we do that, knowing that you will forgive us. We love you for that, Lord. We thank you that you loved us so much to take that death penalty on our, our behalf. So, Lord, we ask now that you will watch over us during the week ahead. Be with Pastor Jay up in Indiana and Dale Ir Gail Irwin as they teach. And we pray for all those who are sick, those who are hurting, Father. And we pray, Lord, that perhaps there might be some even this morning who would want to come to know Christ as their Savior, Father, and you'd be working in their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.